nice to have you uh, with us again. It's been it's becoming a tradition that you're uh, speaking to us, which is a real honor. And I always enjoy listening to you because it's always you always bring something very very new to the discussion. So no pressure on you, but. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's always been very, very interesting. So thank you very much for being with us uh, again. And I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you very much for those kind of remarks. It's a pleasure to be with you again uh, this year. And I'm delighted to join you as useful, you know, uh, because fintech and digital innovation are very top important topics. And as you mentioned in your introduction, the timing of this conference could not be more fitting. Yesterday, the ABA, together with the other European supervisory authorities, Published, we publish our response to the European Commission's call for advice on digital finance. I would like to use this opportunity to reflect on some of the broad themes underpinning the report and other parts of our work on digital finance. First, a few words by way of background and some, and some information on market developments. In terms of background, as many of you will be aware, the European Commission requested the ESAS to provide technical advice on more fragmented or non-integrated value chains, on digital platforms and the bundling of various financial services and on new mixed activity groups, namely groups providing both financial and non-financial services. At the same time, the ABA was also requested uh, to examine to what extent lending provided by financial intermediaries outside the pan-European financial services regulatory parameter exists and how they may evolve in the future. Our findings in this regard to this last item, including on the need for any regulatory changes, will be published next month as the final part of the response to this consultation. Now, the wider scope of the Commission's call for advice highlights the broadening of our collective assessment of the impacts of technology-enabled changes in the EU financial sector. These changes arise in many dimensions that can be grouped in three broad categories. New financial products and services are being provided, new ways of delivering those services by incumbents and newcomers, and deeper and larger interdependencies among players in the financial industry are being developed. Emerging products and services, the first aspect, require us to closely monitor and adapt our regulatory and supervisory frameworks where appropriate. Of course, we continue to monitor the way in which technology is being leveraged to transform delivery mechanisms, where those be customer facing or back office. We have seen, for instance, an acceleration in experimentation and rollout of RegTech solutions and issued a report last year on the benefits, challenges, and risks. The report set out steps as well to ensure the sound adoption and the scaling of RegTech solutions in the EU banking sector. Recently, in a different area, we have also issued a discussion paper and have currently opened a public consultation on the implications that the use of machine learning techniques have in the context of internal rating-based models to calculate regulatory capital for credit risk. Technology is also impacting the structure of the EU financial sector through the emergence of new business models and new entrants. Clearly, payments has been an area of faster development. Following the opening up of payment accounts data as a result of the PSD2, and with that, the growth in the use of APIs to support information sharing, we have seen large innovations and players actively transforming the business. This is an experience that we have had over the last three years where which lessons I think are good to capitalize and learn from going forward. The business model's transformations is affecting all areas of banking. Bundling, cross-selling of financial and non-financial products by new players will likely to rise. Finally, this transformation of business models also brings new interdependencies within the financial sector. The value chain of many financial products is being disrupted, broken. Who does what in the provision of financial service is rapidly changing. By now, we are aware of the increase in cyber-related risk or some of the implications of, of financial institution dependencies on large technology companies, including the big techs, for instance, for data analytics, cloud, platform, and advertising services. The new and more complex interdependencies will continue to arise in the future. Looking across these three dimensions, I think the first, the emergence of new products and services is in relative term, terms, the most straightforward to deal with through targeted perimeter extensions. But the second and third dimensions, the new delivery mechanisms by new players and the deeper structural independence in the financial industry represent on the one hand more transformational potential and opportunity to the industry, and on the other hand as well, more complex challenges for us as regulators and supervisors. Indeed, do we need a paradigm shift in our approach to regulation and supervision? 
Are we equipped sufficiently in both regulatory and supervisory terms to mitigate effectively the risk while leveraging the opportunities that they are, that are being offered? Before I address these questions, let me say a few words about market developments. In the joint ESA report, we identify growing interactions between incumbent financial institutions, fintechs, and big techs through a variety of models, including partnerships, joint ventures, outsourcing, and sub-outsourcing mergers and acquisitions. These firms may also be partnering to go innovate and provide new products or services, leveraging complementary competences and customer bases. For instance, in the context of health insurance, health monitoring, and healthcare. As noted by us, the ABA, in a recent report on the platformization of the EU banking and payment sector, but also by the Bank of International Set Settlements, the Financial Stability Board, and others, there are growing interdependencies between the financial and non-financial sector via rapid growth in the use of digital platforms to bridge customers and financial institutions. Value-added chains are being redesigned. For example, technology companies, including the big techs, are offering mobile payment and digital wallet platform services, which allow users to pay for products and services, albeit the partnering financial institutions remain the relevant payment service providers. We're also seeing new groups emerge, which are active in the financial sector, both through the provision to financial institutions of cloud platform, big data analytics and advertising services, but also through the direct provision of financial services, such as lending and payments, potentially levering their access to data and network effects with customers. These evolutions in value chains and the increasing platformization of the financial sector offer potential benefits for both EU customers and financial institutions. However, new forms of financial, operational, and reputational interdependencies are emerging and give rise to complex issues, including the migration of risks, be it operational, concentration, or step-in risks, also in terms of data access and privacy, who provides data access to whom, and the empowerment of citizens to control how their data is being used and monetized, and also in the adequacy of our supervisory structures. How is our supervisory knowledge in these fields? What are our powers? And what's the adequacy of our cooperation mechanisms to manage these new circumstances? So how should we respond to these issues? As you will all be aware, you know, in the EU in general, we adopt a risk-based approach to regulation and supervision. We act where needed to achieve our objectives of consumer protection, prudential resilience, market integrity, and ultimately financial stability. Sometimes we direct requirements to the performance of, of a specific activity. This is the case, for example, in relation to payments and a strong customer authentication or in relation to AML CFT requirements where activities are subject to the same regulation and supervision, notwithstanding the entity carrying out those activities or the technology leveraged. Other times, for instance, in terms of prudential requirements, we address rules to entities to ensure that combinations of activities and aggregate risks are appropriately regulated, taking account of the impact of collective failure. The object of regulation is not to favor one technology above another, not to prefer or prejudge a particular business model or market player. As such, this approach of technological neutrality is about achieving the right balance between facilitating innovation, scalability, and competition across the internal market, whilst continuing to achieve our central regulatory objectives. Lately, however, there has been something of a debate in policymaking settings about the way in which to respond to the market developments to which I referred earlier. Do we need pivot towards activities or entity-based regulation and supervision? From my perspective, this is not a dichotomy, but alternative tools to be used in different circumstances. In my view, activities and entities-based regulation and supervision are not binary. Rather, to achieve our objectives, both play a role in mitigating a specific types of risks. The proposal for micro, the <coughs> Excuse me. The proposal for MICA illustrates this point very well. Regardless of the type of crypto assets issued, issuers must prepare white papers to ensure that consumers have the information they need to make informed choices, taking account of the key characteristics of the tokens being issued. This is an example of activities-based regulation on my view. However, some issuers who issue crypto assets that are classified as significant will be subject under MICRA to additional requirements, including governance and prudential requirements 
in view of the scale of their activities and potential impact should things go wrong. Here we see an example of an entity space regulation. If we just had a one size fits all approach, this would be neither proportional nor effective in mitigating risks that derive from the impact of failure. The blend of activities and entity space regulation can continue to serve us, but some work is required on the calibration of our regulatory requirements and supervisory structures to get the cumulative approach right in light of value change evolutions, platformization, and new mixed activity groups active in the EU financial sector. Key here to me is the need to ensure we mitigate risks of regulatory arbitrage, we secure a level playing field, and we address gaps in a regulatory or supervisory reach. And of course, not all of this is for us as financial sector authorities and regulators to address, but we need to work together on collective solutions. We need to enhance our cooperation with other regulatory bodies in the areas of data protection, technological security, and competition. Some initiatives are underway already with flagship legislative proposals, such as the Digital Operation Resilient Act, DORA, which will expand the boundary of financial sector supervision to those entities that provide critical ICT services to financial entities. The proposals for the Digital Market Act and the Digital Services Act will also enhance our collective capacity to better protect consumers using online intermediaries and digital, excuse me, and digital platforms within and beyond the financial sector and mitigate exact potential competition issues. For example, online marketplaces, social networks, content sharing platforms, app stores, and online travel and accommodation platforms are proposed to be in a scope and the DMA includes proposals for rules that would apply to gatekeeper platforms. Gatekeeper platforms are digital platforms with a systemic role in the internal market that function as bottlenecks between businesses and consumers for important digital services. Gatekeepers would be prohibited, for example, from treating services and products offered by the gatekeeper itself more favorably in ranking than similar services or products offered by third parties on the gatekeeper's platform. The ABA welcomes these legislative proposals as an essential step toward ensuring a level playing field in the digital environment. But in other areas, work remains to be done. And there, I will turn to some of our key horizontal findings and recommendations that we put forward in the response to the Commission's call for advice. First, closer cooperation between financial and relevant non-financial authorities to address these new challenges. It is clear from our work that the vast majority of financial sector authorities currently have a limited understanding of platform-based business models and value chain evolutions particularly in the context of interdependencies between financial institutions and technology companies outside the perimeter of competent authorities' direct supervision. Over time, this imperfect understanding of business models could impair the effective monitoring of a specific risks, including those risks arising from financial, operational, and reputational interdependencies. As such, close cooperation between different types of authorities, including financial, data, cyber, consumer protection, and competition authorities is needed at the horizon scanning and rulemaking stage, and in the context of the supervision of large technology firms and mixed activities groups as well as we go forward. In this respect, the ESAS recommend the European Commission explores possible ways to foster an enhanced cooperation framework with potential new approaches needed to structure cooperation that will promote information sharing on market and policy developments in each authority's respective sector. And that will also bring authorities together where coordinated policy or supervision action is needed. A second line of recommendation, in light of the emergence of new mixed activity groups combining different types of financial services, and sometimes, non -fin and sometimes also non-financial services, the ESAS note that the existing perimeter of prudential consolidation and financial conglomerate rules may no longer ensure effective coverage of group-wide prudential risks and may give rise to level playing fields issues going forward. For instance, in interaction between bank and non-bank groups that are providing similar services. The ESAS recommend the European Commission to consider potential changes to the perimeter of consolidation rules and potentially new consolidation and structure supervision frameworks. Third, Along the proposal for DORA, 
sorry, third, given that the proposal for DORA provides a framework for the mitigation of ICT risks, regular assessments should also be carried out to determine whether financial institutions exceed dependence on certain providers that may not be captured by DORA, but still represent a risk to financial stability. A fourth area now of action is needed to better protect consumers against this background on market change. There are two aspects to this protection to consumers. One, on one side, supply side measures are needed, such as measures to ensure that disclosure requirements are fit for the digital age. And also on the other side, demand side measures are also needed to ensure consumers have the skills they need to help make informed choices. Here, I would like to point to a need to further clarify the proper use of customer data and the ultimate ownership and understanding of the consumer. To achieve these objectives, we're working in further actions to promote a higher level of digital financial literacy among EU citizens. Our joint ESA's high-level conference on consumer education and financial literacy last week provided some excellent inspiration for our work going forward. Overall, I believe that our recommendations in the response to this call Cost for advice to the scope for advice, sorry, are well targeted, ambitious, and I hope that it will help the Commission progress in addressing these challenges that we are all confronted with. Now, let me also spend a little bit on telling you what can you expect from the ABA in the year ahead. I can assure you that digital finance remains one of the ABA's strategic priorities, and we will be taking forward an ambitious program of work for this year. By way of follow-up to our September 20, 20, 2021 report on digital platforms that I already mentioned, we will support competent authorities in developing common questionnaires for regular financial institutions on digital platforms and enable use. We'll also help them in sharing information about financial institutions' reliance on digital platforms and enablers. On the area of digital operational resilience, the ABA will continue its preparatory activities for the implementation of DORA which we expect now, and it's always subject, obviously, to the progress that's being made with the co-legislators to enter into force in 2023. These activities aim to ensure that the ABA will be well prepared to take up any new tasks under DORA. Moreover, we will be enhancing our focus on cybersecurity through targeted monitoring of the cyber landscape across the financial sector. We will work along with the other ESAs towards addressing the recently published ESRB recommendation on creating a pan-European pan system for cyber incident coordination framework. In relation to crypto assets and decentralized finance, the ABA will develop in 2022 templates that competent authorities can use to facilitate a more converging approach to the monitoring of crypto assets activities at the domestic level. Additionally, the ABA will continue to contribute to ongoing EU and international work streams on crypto assets including so-called global stable coins, and also the prudential treatment of banks' exposure to crypto assets, on which already a further Basel Committee consultation can be expected this year. In the area of artificial intelligence, as mentioned before, the ABA will assess the public feedback received on the discussion paper on the use of machine learning for IRB models, and we will consider whether any considered additional measures should be taken in this regard. Moreover, the ABA will continue following the co-legislative procedure on the proposed Artificial Intelligence Act with a focus on its potential impact in the finance, in the finance sector. Speaking of industry engagement, we will also be organizing a series of RecTech related events where we will invite institutions and RecTech providers to share their experience on the use of RecTech. In parallel, we will continue to facilitate the sharing of best practice among competent authorities on how to use supervisory technology to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of their work and of our work as well. Finally, it goes without saying that the AB is looking into the interfaces between technology, sustainability and product innovation in order to contribute to the green and digital transformation of the EU financial sector and the real economy. Let me close by noting that by leveraging on our insights and expertise that we're building over time, we can all achieve an EU regulatory and supervisory framework that is able to accommodate the benefits of innovation while properly monitoring and limiting the potential concerns on consumer protection, financial stability, and ensuring proper risk management while preventing financial crime. I look forward to continue to engage with you on these issues and draw your attention to our FinTech Knowledge Hub for our publications and information about upcoming events 
as we continue with our prog progress going forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Jose Manuel. You have, as always, not disappointed. It's been a whistle-stop uh, tour of a, a very ambitious work program that you have and a very impressive report that I enjoyed reading yesterday, and I'm still trying to work through all the conclusions of it. Uh, you've agreed to take a few questions. Are you still comfortable? Do you still have a few moments to take a few questions, Jose Manuel? Uh, sure, I'll be happy to, yes. Thank you. And so that's also a reminder to the audience to please have further questions come in. I think raising what you did, I think I've got, let's start with one, I think, which is really the cross-border dimension, because this is what is important in the EU and the single market is the cross-border dimension. And in the last ESA review, the EBA got a formal mandate to look at technological developments as part of its uh, activities. How do, it's maybe hard to say, but how do you see the work going forward on the supervisory side, the relationship between the NCAs, the national competent authorities, and the work by you as the EBA and maybe in the joint committee. How do we see, how, what would be your feeling to deal with cross-border risks and opportunities there? Does it speak for a much stronger ro role for the ESAs? How do you think Europe should organize itself in a supervisory structure to deal with these type of issues? Well, thank you for the question. I think it's fair to say that you know technology is facilitating obviously better distribution of products across borders, and that's one side is very very appealing because it's it's an alternative and a probably more effective and lasting way to in turn to uh, deepen the internal market and to facilitate the functioning of the internal market. I think in that sense that the cross provision of services you know will become more and more prevalent in the context of the new digital environment. Now that puts a challenge on us as well. As you say, you know, it requires more coordination among national competent authorities and, and the European authorities. And I will go even further. It doesn't only require more coordination be between national authorities and the European authorities, but it also requires a bigger and probably better coordination between the European authorities themselves. And I think, you know, the recent joint call for advice and our response to the joint call for advice from the three ESAs is an example of that because the provision, the digital provision of services is not just more likely to be cross-border, but it's also likely to be across the financial sector. So the issues will become more cross-sectoral within the financial sector, and we will need to have a common approach. And both DORA and MICA, as in the current draft regulations, will impose on us further need for coordination. I think at the level of the three ESAs, we're all very committed to enhance that coordination, and we have already, fortunately, uh, developed over the last 10 years good expertise in the context of the joint committee, also sometimes in parallel to the joint committee. So we think that we can continue to enhance that coordination to facilitate that further. But if I may push your question even a bit further, as I mentioned in my initial remarks, the challenge is not just coordination among, among sectoral uh, regulatory and supervisory authorities in the financial sector or among European and national authorities. It's also about, about coordination with other authorities in other areas that are very relevant. Like I, I've said before, competition authorities, data, obviously technological security regulators. So I think these are areas in which we also need to enhance our coordination going forward. I think you make a very good point. And I always say to clients that they, they're collecting more and more supervisors, data privacy, cyber security, as you say, consumer protection authorities, anti-money laundering, uh, is some assortment of different supervisors, not just the prudential conduct regulators, of course, which are at the center of things. I mean, that brings me to another question, which is linked to DORA, and I thought it was very interesting what you said, that you will start and think about preliminary work in anticipation of agreement on DORA. I agree with you. I think we will see agreement quite soon, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But then it will have to be implemented, and this oversight committee or oversight body, depending on whatever its name will be in the end, uh, to be created, and that body then has to decide and start thinking about designating or identifying systemically relevant uh, technology providers. How, uh, it's on the assumption that the text will go through, how do you see this? Because there's a question in the industry, to what extent you have to wait until DORA has been formally implemented before you can start thinking about creating the structures and thinking through who might or might not be designated or could be designated and the preliminary work in advance of that, because I think it's, a, it's an important question of timing. We might otherwise lose another few years before 
the real impact of Dora is felt on the market? Yeah, that's a, that's a very valid question. And of course, from our perspective, we want to be as prepared as we can once the legislation is, is fully developed and fully in place. On the other hand, until the legislation is fully developed, we don't really know the details of how we're supposed to organize ourselves and, and what are the means that we'll have to do so. Nevertheless, you know, within the ABA, we have created already an internal team that's uh, following the legislative developments, also to having uh, working internally on how we will implement our transition to be fully operational once the legislation is in place. That team has been working already for over a year and will continue to work. It monitors very closely the development stuff that's going on with the co-legislators, but we also engage with the other ESAs to try to coordinate. As I said before, also from the point of view of the three ESAs, I think there is a strong commitment to make sure that our coordination in that joint oversight forum that, that will be created, whatever the shape it takes, will be fundamental. And we are stro strongly committed to make sure to, that it provides a ground to make it operational, effective, and at the same time, you know, given that there will be potentially different lead overseers from the different ESAs on the, uh, overseeing different operators in the industry, that that, although the lead overseer may be different, the methodology, the context, and the way in which the oversight is being performed is very homogeneous, so to ensure a level playing field. Thank you. Maybe one small follow-up question on, on Dora, in the sense of, you made this really good point, and also in the paper, about parameter, controlled parameter expansion as, as one of the policy conclusions. So uh, increasing in a way the, the capacity or oversight of supervisors over some non-financial institutions that might be critical in the financial services sector. To what extent do you think DORA is a good model for this? Because I personally, and this is my view uh, only, DORA is not only interesting as DORA in dealing with cybersecurity risks, it also creates a new European architecture a model of oversight rather than supervision that interacts with the supervisors to kind of make its recommendations semi-binding. How, I mean, as we move into new parameters, do you think that's kind of a creative way of dealing with, with these new players in different ways? Could we foresee something similar, for example, around platform operators along the value chain? Um, or how should we deal with some of these as you say, hybrid structures that we're increasingly seeing in our industry? I think, I think it's important to, think, to, to realize that with the, with the innovations, you know, the technological innovations becomes a lot of other more innovations. There's the technological innovation, then there's the business innovation, there's the product innovation, and that changes as I tried to, to in, indicate also in my speech, you know, that changes market structure, changes who is participating, who the players are, and also changes the interdependencies that are created in the industry. And I think in that, in that context, we as regulators need to be aware of those changes, try to understand them as much as possible, and then try to assess them from the point of view of our mandates, which are essentially, as you know, you know really customer protection, financial stability, fighting financial crime. And these are the areas in which we need to look at. You know, uh, I think that the oversight approach is a very good innovative progress going forward you know i would not say that is the end of the process but i think it's the right at least a step at this stage to assess that we'll have to see at, as well how the provision of those uh, services those operational resilience in the financial industry are going my sense is that that's also going not just for the financial industry but it's being provided to many other critical industries in our, in our society, the function of our society, you know, be it for the provision of transportation, energy, or many other parts of, of, of our services that we provide to our citizens, which are, which are just probably as fundamental as financial services. So at some point, if we see that there's a lot of overlap in the oversight from those different sectoral approaches, maybe a more integrated approach will make sense. I mean, but I think we're far away from that situation right now. I think that Dora is a very good first step in that process and we need make, to make sure that that oversight is done well. Thank you. And that brings me, I think, to the last question, which actually fits quite nicely on the back of this, because I was looking at it from the other side of the prism, which is, you're right, we might see these different sector initiatives coming together, but actually when if we look at the EU, at the European Commission, the trend seems to be more to go for horizontal, cross-sectoral initiatives. DORA is an exception, but we've got the NIST Directive, for example. We've got the AI Act. We've got, as you say, the DSA and DMA for platforms, and so on and so forth. So how, this is kind of a question that's come up quite a bit. If you look at the EU 
Artificial Intelligence Act, it will set a high-level principled framework, and it might identify certain financial services as high risk. But then it needs to be translated into day-to-day -day life. And that's, again, where I think the supervisors come in to actually work through what it means if you are high risk in providing consumer credit or life insurance products. What does that actually mean day-to-day -day in the supervisory context? How do you see that interrelationship between the day-to-day -day work and mandate that you're having and some of these cross-sector pieces of legislation that will ultimately have to be given meaning and purpose in the day-to-day -day context in your sector? Well, I think they're both complementary, you know, the, clearly. You know, you need to have some sort of like overarching principles, some um, basis on which certain sectors or certain dynamics, certain sectors, but dynamics in the economic activity evolved. You know, the digitalization which happens across all, all sectors of activity or other dimensions. And I think that's normal that we have those, what is called them umbrella horizontal regulations. As you said, it's our job as sector regulators to make sure that we're able to transform First, not just transform, but first, I, I said to make sure that they're coherent, the overall arching principles with the specific rules or regulations that are already driving the regulation in every specific sector, in my case, banks and payments primarily, you know, but in general for any specific sector. And then beyond that, you also need to make sure how you adapt the existing framework to the new changes that, that, that not just that new regulation, but the new reality underpinning that regulation is bringing into your sector. And here, I think we need to be, uh, if I might say, you need to be very alert to the changes, you know, very open minded to assess and to understand what those changes are and what the implications of those changes are. And at the same time, flexible in the way we need to adapt. adapt. And flexible means not just by using new tools or different tools, but also by having the ability to adjust and adapt those tools as we go forward if we think that we're not well targeted from the beginning. Thank you very much. I could ask many more questions. I think I'm just throwing one out at you. I don't know whether you want to respond to it or not. But we're working towards a single rule book. But actually what technology is requiring us is to give supervisors more discretion and more flexibility. And how to square that circle in a single market will, I think, be interesting to see. Because it creates flexibility but also tension in the supervisory framework. Uh, maybe it's something we can come back to. Jose Manuel, in a year's time, as I say, we call it an annual conference because we seem to never run out of subject matter to talk about. I really appreciate you being with us today, making the time in your very busy schedule. Thank you very much for all the hard work to your team already on the, call for, the response to the call for advice and the other pieces of work. And hopefully we can see you in person soon enough if the circumstances allow us to do so. I hope so, and thank you very much for the invitation again.